Um, hello and good evening. Welcome to our webinar on organic edible gardening in small spaces. My name is Lara and I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator here at the Minnesota State Horticultural Society. I'm so happy to see so many people taking advantage of our free webinar series. Uh, we are pleased to be able to offer educational programs to our members both near and far. You are attending tonight um, in listen-only mode, so you will be able to hear our presenter, but we can't hear you. That way there's no background noise. If you have any questions for Mark or me, you can type those in on the panel on the right side of your screen. We will cover the questions at the end of the presentation. If you don't see the panel, look for an orange arrow in the upper right corner of the screen. Click on that arrow and we'll pop out the panel. Now please welcome Mark. Mark has a degree in botany and has worked in the horticulture industry his whole career, half the time as a grower and the other half in retail. He is a wealth of knowledge and we are so fortunate to have him here tonight to talk organic gardening with us. Thank you, Mark. Take it away. Well, good evening, everybody, and, and thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, you kind of flatter me, Laura, with that, his whole career. Um, it spanned about 30 years, and uh, originally I wanted to go to college, get a PhD, and go out and teach somewhere, and I found myself that first summer as a, a student uh, working in a garden center, and it just enthralled me. Here I stood, you know, in the middle of the yard with a degree in my hand and realized how stupid I really was and that I really didn't know much about plant material at all. So I, I kind of found myself um, learning something new every day. And so here I sit, I can honestly tell you that 30 years later, I feel just as stupid as that first day. So today we're gonna talk about uh, organic gardening in small spaces. And what I'll try to do is relate it to both in the ground and in pots. Uh, we are seeing a huge trend in growing plant material in pots, i.e. vegetables, uh, which is kind of, uh, that's kind of interesting. And it kind of, um, I really, well, the homes back in those days were probably, well, let's say about 1,600 square feet, 1,800 square feet. Well, our homes are getting much bigger and they're up over 2,000 square feet. And so that kind of footprint placed on the same kind of size property, it really diminishes the, uh, the amount of space that we currently have. Plus they always said that to have a, a better homestead garden type garden was really a full-time job. So you were spending 40 hour work weeks just out in your garden. Now, to me, that's not an issue. I'd be, love to spend 40 hours, but we just don't have the time anymore like we used to. So what that means is we're pulling up gardening closer to our house and we're dealing with um, gardening on our patios and on our decks, possibly on any open space that we may have closer to our living space. But when it comes to something like the, the, um, the plant material you see here, basically what I wanted to get across was that the pot, you know, if you're gonna do vegetables in pots, the pot and the soil are just there to hold your plant upright, that's all. And you can typically grow everything in a pot because you're giving it everything else. You know, you're placing it in the sun, you're giving it fertilizer, you're giving it water. So by all means, the sky's the limit when it comes to growing product in pots. So as we're dealing with uh, vegetables, we all know that most of your vegetables require about good so six or more hours of direct sunlight. The problem with this scenario when we deal with growing vegetables in pots is that heat buildup. And what tends to happen is you, you've got a, and just as we'll talk about raised gardens here in a little while, you've got the soil volume elevated above whatever substrate you've got it on. And you can see here in the picture, that's uh, probably the front stoop using a concrete slab. There is a lot of radiant heat given off, not only by the slab, but the side of the house and the sun beating down in that pot. So in these cases, what I would probably do is group your pots together, like they show in the picture here, or put them maybe possibly in a little less sunlight than what they need, that way to keep them cooler. Um, the nice thing about pots is you can turn around and move them around the yard if you want to as well you know, to kind of uh, adjust for that, the difference in sunlight. <clears throat> All right, so when we look at soil, uh, soil has changed a lot. You know, back in my day, when we first started looking at soils, we basically had an organic rich soil that we were dealing with and we were planting a lot of our plant material in. So that means when you ran into your garden center, the, the soil that you saw there, 
did have some organic rich material in it. And so it was a little bit on the heavier side. Well, nowadays we're dealing with what they refer to as a peat light mix. It's basically, there's no uh, organic material in it. And they, I'm talking about most of the brands that are out there. So, you know, your, your miracle Grow, your Schultz's, um, if there's a store brand out there, it's basically composed of a peat moss, perlite, and then there might be something else in there, a vermiculite or, or possibly some coconut core. Uh, moisture control mixes out there in the market nowadays are comprised mostly with using coconut core. And the, the wonderful thing about coconut core is it tends to hold and absorb much more water than peat moss ever did. And so, you know, that was the number one complaint when we were using a lot of these bag mixes was that it was so light. It didn't hold any moisture. You had to water it all the time. Well, coconut core tends to hold a lot more moisture there. Nowadays, we're starting to see um, a lot more compost being put into mixes as we kind of revert back. And the wonderful thing I like about that is Mother Nature does not like change. She likes to stay pretty stable on things. And so by adding some kind of compost or using a, an organic rich black dirt, there's the real stability there. So you don't get those pH fluctuations. The only thing I don't like about it is there's not a lot of control there. And so what I mean by that, as a grower, I have the ability to do a lot more control on growth with a peat light mix. I can fertilize a little bit more. I'm watering a little bit more. And so I tend to get a faster growth out of my plant material. But I do like the fact that, you know, composts are coming back into our soils to create that stability. So um, the components you see on the slide here, uh, they're all used in the market today. The little recipe down there in the bottom there is one that I probably like the best. It's a nice kind of balanced mix with peat moss or core because core is not available on the market. You can buy that at your local garden center um, using compost, of course, for a little bit of weight and heavy end course, um, organic rich material. And then the perlite. And I like perlite versus vermiculite because perlite tends to be a little bit more porous. And so it doesn't tend to kind of hold on to that water like a vermiculite does. <clears throat> so as we look at composting, and this is where I think, you know, we've kind of, we've lost a little bit of that, that knowledge base that we used to have. You know, it, on the market today, we're, we're so uh, instantly gratified by a lot of the, the different things out there that we're not used to waiting. And I think that can sometimes be a frustration for us. But as we look at compost, um, and this is kind of a, where it's a word of warning, um, I'd be a little bit careful, you know, because somebody asked me once if they can just throw, uh, they know a farmer, so can I take that straight horse manure and throw that on my, my vegetable crop? Um, there's where I would probably say no. And the reason why is typically, I mean, raw manures like that, you get what's called a dump. So as it breaks down, the, the bacteria and the fungi that are in soils want to break this material down into something that's more stable. Well, in the process, they release a lot of ureas or ammoniums, which can have a tendency to burn plant material. And so this is where the word of warning comes in buying uh, manures or something like that is, I never trust manures 100%. So a, a word of wisdom would be to, if you're, you know, you're doing vegetable gardens out in the backyard and you have a little plot, apply those manures that compost in the fall of the year, the prior year. And that way they're allowed to go through winter, break down, do their thing. And that way, when you get into the garden in the springtime, you can turn that over and you're gonna have a nice, deep, rich composted material. Same with the bag stuff. You know, I know a lot of these companies out there, they, they try to be really good about uh, turning their piles, but I always feel that there might be a hot spot in there. And what hot spots will do is it, uh, as the bacteria and the fungi are breaking down composted material, it gets, they, they release a lot of heat. Well, it gets to a point where it just basically burns or boils the, the bacteria and the fungi and kills them off. So again, we, even with bag material, apply it in the fall, that way you can turn it in in the spring. So as we look at composting itself, I think the key here is just to know that there's two basic components when it comes to composting. There's green material, and there's brown material. And to have a, a good compost, you need both. So examples of green would be uh, kitchen scraps, you know, the outer leaves of your lettuce, the broccoli leaves, the carrot tops, things along that nature. Uh, when it comes to brown materials, that would be uh, 
like sticks. Um, it would be dried up leaves from the fall, you know, and the key here is to alternate those components. So if I'm starting a compost pile, basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw in my kitchen scraps, I'm gonna throw in my brown material, and they may not be a one-to-one -one ratio, but that doesn't matter too much, just so you have somewhat of a balance there. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a shovel full of dirt and kind of scatter that along the surface. And that shovel full of dirt has a lot of good biota in it, good bacteria and good fungi that are gonna to start to actively break that down. And so that I think is the key is when you look at composting <clears throat> is alternate your materials, throw in some black dirt. You could even put in some fertilizer to kind of feed that because those bacteria and those fungi, they need that food to do their thing to break down this material into something that's organic rich that you can use. And then of course, moisture, uh, make sure you keep it moist. Every once in a while, get out there with the hose so it doesn't dry out. You know, bacteria and fungi need to have a moist environment. <clears throat> so we have theoretically our compost that we've used and we've let, allowed it to sit for hopefully a month or more. And now it's this deep, rich black organic source. You can make a composted tea. And where I find a composted tea works really well is in a, a foliar application. Now there's all kinds of information out there that talks about the validity of using a composted tea. Um, I think applied to the soil, I don't know that it's enough uh, nutrition to to give to a lot of our plant material out there. You know, if you have a tomato plant that's growing out in your garden, you could basically, if you went along and whispered water across the top of a tomato plant, it's going to grow a foot on you. And so that's a lot of growth that needs to be, uh, have nutrition applied. So using a composted tea, I don't know if that's going to give it enough nutrition. But where I do like this is in a foliar application. And so if I'm coming along and um, I know my plants are growing fast. Um, I could possibly see a deficiency starting, you know, after a spurt of growth or something like that. I can come along with a composted tea and I can kind of give it a, a quick fix. So it's, it's kind of like fast food. It's there temporarily, but then it's gone. So to do this, basically you can make little uh, cheesecloth packets like you see there in the photo and then dump them into a five gallon bucket with an air supply and just let that sit overnight. And you can either, of course, dump that on the ground the following day or put it, strain it, put it in mister bottles or spray bottle or something like that and apply it to your plant material. So it's, it's kind of a nice um, quick nutrition source for your plant material. Um, as we look at fertilizer, and this is, I think this is an area that we're really going to struggle with as we kind of get back into organic gardening. And don't get me wrong, I love this. I remember back in the 70s when I was a kid, there was a, a short organic movement, only lasted a few years, but then all of a sudden it was gone again. So I'm really kind of happy to see this kind of come back as we look at, you know, what's going on in, in the world today. It's just insane what we're doing to our earth. Uh, but that's another story. So anyway, as we look, um, the little label down there in the bottom left, that's basically for a water-soluble fertilizer currently on the market. And what tends to happen with these things is, again, what I referred to earlier is instant gratification. You can typically apply these fertilizers one day and you see the results the next. But as I said, it's water soluble and that's the drawback to it is the next time, let's say it rains, let's say you come along and we're in the heat of summer and you're watering every day. The minute you apply water to your, your, your pots, to, to the ground, a lot of that fertilizer that you just applied leaches away or moves away from your, the root zone. And that's where organics comes in. And that's kind of the one reason I like that is, again, Mother Nature does not like change. And so she will have a tendency to kind of hold on to a lot of this nutrition that happens in our soil. And you can kind of see that with the nitrogen cycle off to the right side here. Uh, now, when it comes to that, I had mentioned that a lot of these um, nutrients tend to be bound within the soil. So there's um, some products out there that can kind of help with that. I don't know if you've ever heard of a, a product called soil conditioner or humic acid. Now there's a product that's basically uh, made from a, a soft brown coal, uh, in this case, leonardite. And what it does is it works within the soil and it has a tendency to, it's being a soft acid, it tends to kind of break those bonds that are happening within the soil. And so it can really allow your fertilizer applications to be a lot more effective. But 
with the soil. I mean, that's the whole beauty of it. A lot of these nutrients will be available to your plant material all along. Roots can be a friend and they can be a foe. I can tell a lot just from looking at a root system. In fact, I can tell you how well your plants grow just by looking at it. So if you look at that, that photo on the left side there, your, your primary root that runs up and down like that, that's your, your tap root. Uh, then you have secondaries that kind of run off that, off to the left side there. And then there's tertiaries, which are the little finer roots that kind of come off the secondaries. And then there's quaternaries, et cetera, et cetera. Till finally you get down to a point where you're dealing with root hairs. So as we look at um, the effectiveness of water or the efficiency of water and nutrition, uh, the key component there is in the root systems is the root hairs. Now root hairs take up, up about 90% of your, your moisture and your nutrients. So when you look at kind of getting plant material established and allowing them to grow um, and, and flourish, it's really about developing that whole root system, not just having a tap, a secondary, a tertiary. And the reason being is your tap roots and your secondary roots along there are basically storage units. All they're doing is storing energy from the plant material itself. So if you ever watch a plant grow, it basically goes through a little bit of a growth spurt and then it stops. And then there's another growth spurt and then it stops. Well, it's all about balance with plant material. And so what's happening is your plant is growing green and then it stops and then it's developing a root system to support that. And then it's more green, more root system. So as we look at making sure your plant um, your, or your fruit or vegetable starts to, or is, is efficient in its uptake, it's all about developing those root hairs and creating that, that consistent moisture and that consistent nutrition you know, throughout its growth cycle. And all too often, what we tend to find is, especially when we're dealing with plants in pots, is we let them dry down too much. You know, they get up in the morning and the weather guy says that, oh, you're going to see rain today, bring an umbrella. And so you just assume as you rush out the door that your plants are going to be watered. Well, you come home, it's been sunny all day long, and of course your plants are wilting and they're scorched. Well, in that process, of course, a lot of the roots are dying off because the, the, the root hairs tend to be the smallest part and they are more susceptible to that, that drying. So the key is consistently, uh, consistency. And so my best advice would be to make sure that you water. It, it doesn't matter what the weather people say. Um, as we look at roots can do, you can really tell a lot about root structure, especially when it deals with pots. Uh, the upper photo there, which shows is in the soil, you'd have a tendency for plants to grow both laterally and vertically, uh, which is a good thing. But as we deal with plants in pots, there lies the struggle. All too often I see pots that are placed on the deck or on a patio and they've got a saucer underneath it and you're out there and you're, you're, you're trying to be good about it and so you're watering and all of a sudden here's where complacency kind of comes in that one or two days, kind of little, maybe a week or two into the growth phase, you figure, ah, the water's fine in there, the soil will soak it back up. But what tends to happen is you get stagnation in the bottom part of the soil, and that's where root rot starts to happen, and it tends to kind of move up. The other thing that can commonly happen, and I see this more in houseplants more than anything, because we see them over a longer period, is that as we pull plants out of their pots, you either see roots at the top, or you see roots at the bottom of the pot. And so when I see a, a root structure where all the roots are growing near the top, what that basically tells me is that this person is watering, but they're not watering thoroughly. So that water is coming out the bottom of the pot and then they're not letting it dry out. So in essence, the plant, it doesn't need to throw a deep root system. It doesn't need to develop a, a good healthy root system because all that moisture is being applied at the top and that's where it finds it. Conversely, if we find roots on the bottom, but not located from halfway all the way to the surface, what that tells me is that bottom is the only place where moisture is found and that's, that pot is drying too much. And there lies the dilemma is, you know, how much do you water? How often do you water? And that can sometimes be the hard part, especially when we're dealing with plants in pots is that initially our plants aren't growing that much. They're, they're developing a root system. They're trying to grow into that new space that they've got. And so you have a tendency to water much less. But as we move into summer, 
and that plant does get established into that pots and those roots do grow uh, that you have to pick up on your watering and you're watering almost every day through Ju you know june and july and also you get into august you can kind of taper back a little bit towards the end and so it's knowing when that occurs when you need to water when you don't so here is a, a, another piece of advice for you is i always think it's a great thing now we're, we're talking about plants in pots now I think it's a great thing that we we watch the soil to see when that soil is drying out but that's kind of when our subconscious mind takes over and when the minute we see that soil dry out we want to get in there with a, a can of water and thoroughly water it um, the problem with this scenario is that what you're seeing is the surface and you're seeing the surface dry out now let's say you're, you're pretty good about it and you stick your finger down in the soil to test to see if there's moisture down below the issue I have with that though is your finger can only go down so far and you have no idea what's happening in the rest of the pot. So another thing you can do is get a like the old wooden pencils that are still around or even a, a chopstick will work. And you can take that, push that all the way down as far down as you can get it, let it sit for 10, 15 minutes and then pull it out to see if there's moisture there. So that's kind of a good indication. The other one is I always watch my soil. The minute it dries out, I turn my attention to the plant itself. As long as that plant is healthy and it's still upright and it's still doing its thing, it, I let it go because I can always water later. But once I water, I can't take that water away. So I hope that I explained it a little better. Um, now, when we deal with root systems, this is kind of a, when we deal with organics, and we're going to talk a little bit about insecticides and fungicides um, and this, I really like this one here. This is mycorrhizae. It's actually a good fungus that battles the bad fungus. And what it does is you can see the photo on the upper left there, that, that root system on the left had a mycorrhizae applied to it early on in growth. And the one on the left was kind of a, what do they call it? A, a, a one that they just kind of monitor. They haven't done really anything to it, but it's the same cuttings same age but you can see with the mycorrhizae attached how much more effective that plant was at producing a root system and being protected so here's the way this this mycorrhizae works you apply it as a drench it typically comes as a powder um, it moves throughout the soil the, the little fungus starts to grow if you will and it attaches itself to the root system of plant material and it grows along with the root system. So in essence, what it does is it puts a little anchor inside the root system and grows on the outside edge of your root system. So as your roots grow, so does this mycorrhizae. And so it actually does a couple of things. It, it has this symbiotic relationship with roots. It protects the root system of the plant, but it also takes a, a few nutrients from the plant itself. But what it does for a bad fungus out there, and two of the more common ones we see are root rots um, in the way of Pythium and Rhizoctonia, is it basically outcompetes the fungus. The fungus, the bad fungus, never really has a chance to attack the root system. So, I mean, this is this one's kind of hard for me because I, I'm kind of a sea feel touch kind of guy. And now we're dealing with something that's in the microscopic realm of things. But it does work um, as growers. We've been using them for years. Whereas, you know, we used to, to plant Easter lilies and poinsettias and we would drench in with um, so a chemical drench and then apply that chemical drench probably every three, four weeks, you know, initially until the plant matured. With the mycorrhizae here, we basically just drenched it once or twice throughout, and it was so much more inexpensive and so much more effective than a, than a chemical fungicide would be. As you can see there, there's two different types, uh, the ecto and the endos. Um, endos are the one that's most common in the marketplace, and you can still find them. Uh, Purple Cow is a brand um, out of Wisconsin, and they have, uh, I think it's called Biotone. Um, Mike is another brand and that's M-Y-K-E. Um, you can find them currently on, uh, I think on the web, you can probably find those. But those are mycorrhizae that uh, are currently on the market. Um, most of your bio, um, bio bags, bio material that you can find in garden centers does tend to have some of this already included. 
So as you flip over and look at the label, it'll tell you it has so much nitrogen and so much phosphorus, but down at the bottom, you'll see all this bacillus and, and usually mycorrhizae are included that. So as we look at different ways to water, um, there are a ton of different ways now. And uh, if you look at that upper left photo, um, this is something that growers have used for years. Now you can imagine growing 20,000 geraniums, four and a half inch geraniums in a greenhouse, how long it would take to sit and water these things. Well, they've come out with these automated watering systems. So all a grower has to do, come in, flick a switch, run it for 15, 20 minutes, and boom, you watered the whole crop. Well, these have come down in price, and there's actually a couple of brands on the market there that have become very affordable. Uh, now, we carry Rainbird, so I'm kind of familiar with that one, but it's exactly what you see there. So as you look at um, her hand, you can see the brown tube that kind of runs there. That is the supply line. That's basically what you're going to run along your deck or your patio. Now, there's a, a little emitter, which is that little black button kind of attached to the brown hose. And what that does is it tends to regulate water that flows through it. Um, in this case, what tends to happen is when you turn on the water, it tends to flood that tubing. Well, in the old days, if you just had tubes coming off your supply tube, it basically watered your first pot first. And by the time it got to the end of your deck or patio, that would be the last one that would start watering if your pressure was good enough. Well, what these emitters do is balance that that pressure all along the line. So the water rushes through that brown supply tube, goes all the way to the end of the line, and then starts flowing out the emitter. And so all your pots are watered very evenly. And it comes in, the emitters come in many different types. You can get half gallon per hour, you can get one gallon per hour, five gallon per hour. So there's a lot of different ways you can do this. And so it's wonderful because now you're not so tied to, to watering. And that was always, well, I can't go away for the weekend. I can't go up to the lake because I get them, my pots are gonna die. I can't trust the neighbor to water them. Um, so that, that's an amazing thing. So I would highly recommend if you're gonna get into something like this, purchase, you know, this this automated watering system. And you can get as little or as much as you want. They're fully expandable to whatever you need. Of course, we've all seen the whole pop bottle thing where you fill the pop bottle up and kind of flip it upside down and it slowly gurgles and waters your, your pot. Now, the, the photo on the upper right there is, I, I had a friend who grew a tomato in a hanging basket. And yes, I say a hanging basket. You can imagine by the end of summer how big or how dead this thing was, but this is what he did. So he hung this hanging basket off his garage and up on the roof, he created this little wooden platform where he put this little five gallon bucket. Um, now he drilled a hole in it. I, I used a, a bigger drill bit just to kind of give you an example, but he just put a pinhole in it. And then what he did is he just ran a, a garden hose up the side of his garage along his roof and it went into his bucket. So all he had to do every day was come out, fill up that five gallon bucket with water, turn off the water and drive away. And all day long, that little hole would just go drip, drip, drip and water those pots. So, I mean, this, the sky is the limit when it comes to developing different ways to water. Uh, soaker hoses for, for gardens are an excellent thing. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's, as far as watering is concerned, it's it's kind of taken the, the struggle away from it. But like I said, uh, the last thing you want to do is leave for the end of the day and not, or for the beginning of the day and not water your plant material. Oh boy. So as we look at bugs, uh, we're all familiar with our Japanese beetle here. I picked them because it was a nice, big, colorful photo. Um, you can see on the bottom left, there's aphids and the, on the top left, there's, there's thrip. Now, thrip are probably one of the smaller ones that I've seen. Spider mites would be another one. And they're all shapes, sizes in between when it comes to being outdoors. So as, as we look at this, this is where um, now growers have uh, dealt with a process called integrated pest management for a long time. And basically, it is what you see there on the bullet points. It's a pest management program that allows for scouting, insect identification, Introducing yourself, which basically means get to know your bug because every bug has a season um, and it'll do the most damage during that season. You can't say that, oh, I had aphids last year and just start a spray program right from the get go and, and be spraying all summer. This is where organics kind of takes, um, I, th I think, a little bit more of a, a, a knowledge approach. 
um, getting to know what bugs are going to attack when. We all know Japanese beetles come out at the end of June. They're here for six weeks and then they're gone. So, I mean, you wouldn't start spraying for Japanese beetles right from the get-go. So introduce yourself, uh, get to know your bug, and then you can take action. So it, it used to be where you could walk into a garden center and you would come upon somebody like myself and you'd grab a leaf in your hand. You'd say, I have this. And I'd say, oh, okay, well, take this. And then you'd march home and make your application of whatever it was and it would take care of it. Pesticides have gotten um, a lot better, a lot more interesting, a lot more specific over the years. If you take a look at the current pesticides that you have now, most of them have lower warning labels than what you would find underneath your sink or counter. Um, I think Lysol is more poisonous and more harmful than a lot of your pesticides out there. Now, I don't say that to kind of diminish the, the whole pesticide thing, because that's the last thing. I mean, I've sprayed pesticides for a long time, and that was the last thing I want to do is bring that home to my family. But when it comes to pesticides now, they have become much more specific. And we'll talk about that here for a minute. The other thing is persistence. Um, as you look at the, the life cycle right there, you can see there's egg, larvae, pupa, and adult. So when you take and spray, and I'm just going to kind of go over both categories right now, whether it be synthetic or organic, synthetic being man-made chemical, um, synthetics typically had a nice contact. So in other words, you spray your bug, you could basically just watch them fall off your plant. Plus there was some residual activity to it. Well, as we become more aware what this residual activity is in our environment, we've kind of made the switch and we're kind of getting rid of those nasties that have been on the market. Now the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and the EPA have done a really good job of that. But, um, so, which means there's not a lot of longevity to the chemicals. And here's where the persistence come in, because when you spray a pesticide, basically what you're killing off is the adult stage. And so that was where usually the, the failure came because you'd come along, you'd spray the bug, it was gone. You'd say, ah, got that licked and you'd walk away. Well, the eggs and typically the pupa stage tend to be resistant to most heat and chemicals. And so what typically tended to happen was seven days later, all of a sudden they were back again and you're going, oh my goodness, what happened? Well, that pupae turned to adult. So the persistence comes in knowing that when you make your spray, whether you use, you know, write it on the calendar, in your phone, whatever, make sure that you spray another five to seven days later. And what that's going to do, it's going to get at every successive life stage of that insect. So your first is going to kill off that adult. A week later, that second is going to kill off the pupae, which now turned to adult. And then that third is going to kill off the larvae, which went to pupa, which went to adult. And so you can kind of see where this is going. So pest management is about scouting, making sure you get out there. And it's not enough, you know, I'm, I'm a cup of coffee kind of guy. I love being out in the garden every day, walking around, seeing what's changed, what's what blooming differently than, than yesterday. But in this case, scouting means getting in there and actually really looking down low, flipping over some leaves and looking. Um, knowing what that insect is that you're going to start attacking. Is it a good bug? Is it a bad bug? And of course, in taking the, the steps of taking action and then the persistence. The hard part is, as we look at it, um, we're starting to see a lot more beneficial insects out there. Uh, we're starting to be aware of a lot more beneficial insects out there. Um, we've all kind of heard of the whole imidacloprid thing and the, the bee colony collapse. Um, there's, I think it's way more involved than just blaming a pesticide, but it really did drive home the fact that what are these chemicals doing? And we're starting to see, you know, populations of monarchs diminish in bees. So you're starting to see a lot of these being used um, in the, the actual greenhouse industry. Uh, my last stint at Linder's, we did a, a biological program at the retail. And so for, I think for a year and a half, we never sprayed a pesticide. Um, I have growers now that supply me at my current vocation, and uh, two of them, both of them produce my annuals and my vegetables. They both use benefic beneficial insects in their, uh, their programs. Um, these are even available for you folks at home, too, which I think is a great thing. But I would not suggest walking into your local garden center and saying, I'm looking for predaceous mites or predaceous wasps, because these things are best purchased online. The reason being is that 
Um, if you, let's say garden centers carried them and you walk in and say, I'm looking for these and they go on the back and they pull them out. So that, that wasp, that beneficial insect has gone from the, the producer to the garden center and now to you. Most of these places nowadays really like them to ship them directly to you so that way they're as live as possible, as viable as possible. And so usually what will happen is you'll turn around and order them on a Thursday. They're not going to ship until Monday because they want that thing to be there during the week. So you're going to be there and grab it. They don't want it sitting on a doorstep outside or anything. And that way when you go to release these, of course, you can um, get a more of a viable population. Now, I have had questions on releasing these things into the environment. Um, you know, are they a, a natural pest or are they a natural beneficial insect that we have? And I guess my answer would be most of these tend to be very specific to the, the insect that are attacking. And most of them tend to be found in nature. Not all of them, of course, but what they're just as fragile, if not more, than a lot of our, our bad insects out there. I mean, our bad insects have been born and bred in Minnesota, and therefore they know our environment. There's a, a variety of predaceous mite that is from Israel. And it has very narrow range of uh, environmental conditions that it will live in. Otherwise, it tends to die. So uh, there's really some neat things happening in beneficial insects out there. Um, I would highly suggest looking into it. It uh, when I was uh, at the retail at Linders, it just fascinated me. Nematodes are another one. Now these are really good for uh, dealing with soil dwelling insects. Um, in the case of you know beetles and grubs and such. Um, I have had people in looking at milky spore as a way to control um, a lot of the grubs that are in lawns. And I've seen too many reports done by too many universities that says it really isn't effective. And the premise was that it increased the population of spores that were in the ground. Well, oftentimes that just doesn't work. Uh, but nematodes are very aggressive little critters and they physically seek out and destroy a lot of these organisms. And they do that by the little uh, picture you can see on the bottom left there. And so as nematodes, nematodes will find a host, they basically enter the host either through the mouth or through the, the breathing holes along the side of the insect. And of course, once inside they develop, they release bacteria and kill off the host that way. Uh, so this is kind of a neat thing. Again, just like with the beneficial insects, these are best purchased from the producer, from the manufacturer and they will come in a little packet that you can apply. So pretty cool technology. Use of pheromone lures. Um, this is something that I think will be up and coming. Um, most of you may be familiar with the pheromone lures that are used in attracting Japanese beetles. I tend to find that it's a love-hate relationship. Some people say that by using pheromone lures, you're attracting them to your yard. Uh, I would contend that they're coming anyway. And the key is in their use. And I think that's where some of the failure comes from. Um, in this case, using pheromone lures is, is a good way to kind of detect when you're going to start to see a population grow. As growers, we kind of use the ones on the bottom left there quite a bit. And these were used to attract thrip. Now, thrip are basically what I refer to as walking slivers. They live in the tips of plants. They do harm to flowers. Uh, usually by the time you see the damage, they've been there and gone. So they're really hard to detect. But the pheromone lures, what we did is we stuck them to sticky cards. And that way it would attract the insect to the sticky cards. And that way we can kind of monitor their population. We are seeing a lot of pheromone lures being used by the, uh, the cities and the states to monitor gypsy moth, um, to monitor uh, marmorated stink bugs. Uh, so this is something that's been used for a while. And I think we'll, as consumers, we will start to see them more as we kind of delve into this whole organic movement. Looking at insecticides, oh my goodness, time is flying by. Um, insecticides, there's a lot out there in the market, and I, I put some of these up just so you can kind of be aware of them. Um, the one, the insecticidal soap there, this one concerns me a little bit because oftentimes we think that we can just go to the store, grab some liquid dish soap, and make up a spray bottle. Uh, but my warning is that is if it, you look at the soaps, if it's a natural soap, I think that's great. It's perfectly fine. But most of the soaps nowadays, they have perfumes in them. They have fragrances. They have antibacterials. They're not really designed to be applying to plant material. 
So stay away from them, stick to the more natural ones, or go with uh, an insecticidal soap that's been developed for you know safe on plant material. Um, some newer ones that have arrived on the market that you know I, I'd say well new as in 10 years ago <clears throat> is things like neem oil. Now neem oil was um, was found, first found in Africa. Uh, some of these trees, the neem tree, were were found you know like a let's say a grasshopper infestation came through. They left these trees alone, and so scientists kind of uh, developed this or found that the neem in the or the the oil itself kind of repelled the insects. And so neem oil, what it does is two things. One, you get kind of a, a suffocation type effect to it because it is an oil; it will suffocate your insects. The other thing it does, it acts as a repellent. And so while these insects are in the area, they can re, uh, the plant can actually repel the, the insects' activity. A word of caution here, though, is it is an oil, and in such, be careful when you're spraying this on hot summer days. Uh, try to spray early in the morning or late in the evening, and I usually try to do that anyway because I want to stay away from bee activity. So before, you know, bees are active when the sun comes up and until the sun goes down. So I usually try to stick to those times. Spinostat is another one that's been on around for a good 10 years or so, but I'm pretty excited about this one because this is really effective. It gets at a ton of different bugs. Um, this one's kind of got a fun story to it. Um, this one was found in a rum distillery in Jamaica. Uh, one of the scientists that was there on a, a tour found that there was no insects in this this rum distillery area and that he was kind of curious about that so he asked if he could come back and take samples well they found this bacterium that was lived in the soil that basically killed off anything that kind of kind of invaded the territory uh, so it's it's very effective it's it's pretty safe on things it, unlike our neem oil this one can be sprayed at different times but again usually I usually like to stick to morning and evening when the, the bees aren't as active <clears throat> Uh, fungicides, uh, the problem here with fungicide is typically chemical, here's where chemical works a little better. Uh, most of our fungicides on the market today are really either a, um, they either uh, stop them from developing or if you've got a problem, as in the case of powdery mildew or something like that, it's it's really hard to cure it. So most of them tend to be more preventative in nature. Now, things like copper and sulfur do have a tendency to kind of be very effective in clearing things up, but they are a foliar um, type fungicide. So they're very effective at controlling a lot of the fungus that will attack flowers, botrytis, uh, powdery mildews, uh, rust on, on roses and things like that. Of the two, I really like copper the best, but I think that's kind of preference. Here's a new one that's on the market. This is Revitalized by Bonide here. Um, this was kind of fun, and I think there's a lot of potential here. Now, if we go back to that slide about talking about mycorrhizae, um, this one is very similar to that, except for where the mycorrhizae is a fungus. This one's a bacillus, so it's a bacteria that physically attaches itself to the root system of plant material and it grows along with roots. Um, unlike our mycorrhizae, which can kind of seek out and destroy some of those bad funguses, this one just basically outcompetes any fungal infections. But what they found with this one is it actually, for a better sense of the word, revitalizes plant material, but they found that, you know, grown side by side, one with and one without, the plants that were grown with this revitalize had a, a, a much stronger growth habit than those that were without. And so what it tends to happen with this one is as it's colonizing the root system, it's it's basically breaking down a lot of the things that happen in the soil next to it. And so the roots are able to kind of grab hold of these these nutrients that are being let go from this uh, bacteria. So this one, uh, brand new on the market. I haven't seen it yet. Um, it is coming in this spring, so I'm kind of excited to see and, and trial this one. This one does come as a concentrate and it are ready to use. I question the, the ready to use product of, of this only because typically with organic products, they're very effective when things are moist. So when you spray this on the foliage, it works, but once it's dry, it's no longer effective. Um, so I see this one having a lot more potential in the soil versus actually spraying it on the foliage. 
So as we look at herbicides, um, there's a couple of things here. What we know of organic herbicides is, as we look at the one on the left there, and there's many out there on the market, most of them have a tendency to be very non-selective, meaning it kills whatever it touches. They basically tended to be clove oil or um, in vinegar, maybe. So it basically burned off the foliage, but it really struggled killing it off root and all. Um, and that's that's one of, one of the drawbacks to this. Now it worked fine in the garden when you were spot spraying some weeds, but elsewhere, not too good. There's some really kind of fun things happening in this area as well. There was a, a company that I came in contact with last year that is developing herbicides that you can actually spray on your lawn that selectively choose broadleaf weeds. Uh, there's another one that you can spray on your lawn that is a pre-emergent for crabgrass, but it leaves the other grass alone. And so as I was talking to the president of the company, he said, um, what the one with the, the pre-emergent for crabgrass it has the ability to recognize, and it must be something chemical that happens, but the root structure of a developing crabgrass versus the root structure of one of our more bluegrass or a fescue or something along that line. So as we look at the corn gluten on the right side here, um, corn gluten has the ability to be a pre-emergent. Um, it's also a fertilizer. But this is something that corn gluten really tends to be more effective when it's used uh, consistently year after year. So the first year, you'll probably notice not much. Second year, it gets a little bit better. Third year, even better yet. The drawback here is as we look at trying to produce a vegetable crop with something like this, it's basically going to stop any germinating seeds. So even next year, if you say, yeah, I'm going to plant some lettuce seeds or carrot seeds, you know, something that's beans or something that's better planted directly, you know, this is going to stop that from happening. So you have to be careful. So what you can do is to minimize a lot of the weed activity is um, you can put news, uh, layers of newspaper down. You can use uh, straw or hay that you've used to cover the, the prior winter. Save that, set it aside, and kind of use that for the paths in between your vegetable rows. All right, moving on into some plant material and, and fun ways to grow. Um, I, I, this is great. I mean, remember the year, years ago we used to see container gardens. It was basically your geranium, your spike, your springer eye. Um, think of vine off to the side, where we're starting to see a lot of creativity with ed, um, edible containers and using other things as well. So this is kind of exciting to me, and the, the hybridizers realize this and have seen this, and so a lot of their focus and energy has gone into really producing a lot of varieties that really perform well in containers, um, even down to even smaller containers, and we'll talk a little bit about more of those coming up here. But here's some different ways um, that you can utilize kind of the small spaces that we have. Um, here's the trend that I was referring to in the first part of our uh, opening lines is kind of gardening up closer to the house. Um, here you see per some person growing their fruits and vegetables on the deck. Now you can imagine, oh, I, first time I noticed that little mason bee house. <clears throat> but you can imagine um, cooking in the evening. And say, I think we need a salad going on. And stepping out on your deck, grabbing a few lettuce leaves, pulling up a carrot. Uh, maybe a tomato has ripened, a uh, pepper has ripened. So, I mean, all those things are at your fingertips. Um, utilizing flavors of basils and rosemaries, fresh in cooking. The one on the right here, this was a friend of mine. He basically, <laughs> here's the irony of this. Uh, what was underneath there was basically grass before. He concreted over, and now he's got plant material back onto it. I thought that was a little bit irony. But, I mean, he had the right idea. He's pulling those, that, that gardening right up closer to his home. If you look at raised gardens, um, there's a lot of interest in this in the past, past few years here. Joel Karsten, uh, Minnesota's own, came up with the uh, <clears throat> straw bale gardening there, if anybody's tried one. Um, I've had some people say they've... Not too luck, but I think I've had more that have actually said I have really good luck with them. I think the key is in culturing the bales, and that's going to take um, the year before. You know, so you're going to have to buy your straw bales in the fall of the year and make sure you culture them through the winter so they're ready to plant in the in the summertime. But the thing I like about raised beds is it really does extend our season. You can imagine that soil raised above the surface, and now you've got the sun beating down not only on the soil surface, but also on the sides of your raised beds. So you can actually get almost two weeks earlier planting out of your raised beds. The other thing I think it likes, especially as we age, the ergonomics to the whole thing, it's a little easier on our backs. 
Um, vertical is another way to do things in small spaces, and the sky is the limit. Disney's been doing this, God, for as long as I can remember as a kid. Uh, we went down there and took the greenhouse tour and, and saw them vertically garden. But I, I want to take note of the, the one on the right here. I mean, basically what he's done is he's basically stacked some pots and he's growing leaf lettuce in most of them and broccoli on the top one there. But as you take note, and this was something I noticed later on, is he's actually got that automated watering system running across the top of that. And so it's a nice way for him to water those pots <clears throat> all the way. Now, if you're going to do something like this, what I would suggest, though, is if, in theory, if you're looking at that and you're applying water to that top pot, that top one's got to get soaking wet before it's going to leak into the second one and so on and so forth. Um, I take issue with the soluble salts that may occur in the bottom. You know, you might get a buildup of soluble salts there. And so what I would actually do is get a PVC pipe, drill some holes along the sides of it and insert that right straight down in the middle. So that way, when you water, you're actually watering into that PVC pipe and it's to, to, uh, dispensing through each pot at the same time. And that way you're getting nice, even watering. Pockets uh, can be another fun way to, to garden in small spaces. And again, bringing this up closer to our home. The one on the right there is basically a shoe rack. Um, the only thing I would take notice of is, I think that second row, they've got tomatoes in there not cool for those little pockets. But this would be something that I think would be kind of fun for, um, let's say herb gardens, where you, you know, you're know you kind of moving through your herbs at a quick, pretty quick pace. You could do spinach or lettuce or mustard greens or something along that line, stuff that you can kind of rotate in and out pretty quickly. And that's where I think a lot of these pockets really have good versatility is, is in fast cropping things. Um, if you don't use Smart Pots, this Smart Pots is a brand, but um, I grew one of these a couple years ago, and it was just something that was kind of sitting in the greenhouse there. I was doing some spring cleaning and had a little bit of soil in, and I didn't think anything of it. So I actually threw a tomato plant in one, and then I kind of filled it up, you know, the rest of the way with soil. And I was so proud of myself all summer long looking at this thing. It was just the most beautiful tomato plant I'd ever seen, thinking that it was all about me. Oh, how wrong I was. Uh, I got to year number two and the same thing happened, but there was a little bit more adversity to the weather. And so I started to think about this and then it dawned on me. So what a smart pot basically is, it's, it's a fabric pot. And what it was doing was a process called root pruning plant material. And so in essence, what happens is as you plant your pots in, or plant plants into a pot like that, the roots are growing not only laterally across the um, horizontal plane, but also vertically. But when they hit that that fabric's edge, like a clay pot, you know, that allows air to kind of pass back and forth in it, so does this fabric. And so what that fabric was doing, it was basically drying out the root tip that had exposed itself to that fabric pot. And of course, just like pinching effect, that one little root broke into two. And of course, those two would grow through the soil, hit the side of that fabric, dry out, pinch into four. So exponentially, it was producing this massive root system. And so what I was getting is we go back to the roots friend or foe was that I was producing all these, these root hairs, these, um, these tertiary and quaternary root systems that were much more effective at picking up nutrients and water. So it, it's kind of a fun deal. I think there's a lot of potential in here. Um, they do dry out a little bit more quickly and possibly leaching of nutrients could happen a little bit more quickly. So watch that, you know, as some of our plants can tend to be kind of somewhat vigorous. I highly recommend using more fragrant plants um, near, near accesses, near patio doors, near doors, um, not only for us sake, but the ability for them to repel insects is enormous. And I all too often see uh, people coming into the store looking for some kind of insecticide they can spray around the outside because um, ladybugs, box elder bugs, spiders, you know, they're, they're moving in through those cracks and those crevices, especially as we keep the doors open more and more. But there's nothing greater than walking past or walking up the stairs, brushing along the side that rosemary, that basil, and having that fragrance waft off and hit us. Um, it's just a, an amazing thing. And you get the secondary effect of repelling insects. So here we have a uh, small space. This is all within a 10 by 10. And you can see there they've grown bok choy, kale, lettuce, chives, and Swiss chard all in that one space.
The thing I like about it is it also tends to be somewhat ornamental in nature too. So it doesn't always have to be about, you know, trying to be more efficient. You can use a lot of this stuff as ornamental purposes while still harvesting them. Ooh, my favorite part, plant material. Okay, so we got about 15 minutes here. Uh, so as we run through them, um, what I tried to do is pick out a lot of plant material that has an, um, is would be more effective, uh, better apt to deal with smaller spaces. Uh, some of them are zone four. Some of them tend to be annuals. Um, I even think I have a zone five grape in here, but it was kind of a fun grape. So here we go. Um, Colonnade and Urban Apples, these are brands that are out there. And basically they developed um, as kind of up, upright more apple trees. They, uh, they don't really produce a lot of side shoots. And when they do, those lateral branches tend to be very short in stature. And so this whole apple tree will be probably, you can see eight to 10 feet tall, but only two feet wide at its maturity. So it's really kind of a tall, narrow one. So, uh, you know, typically when we're looking at trying to grow apples and with these massive canopies, you had to have this pretty big yard. Okay, well, let's espalier them and we'll put them against a wall or a fence. Well, here comes a variety that you really don't have to. It grows tall and narrow. So kind of a fun one. Um, I threw this slide in here, going back to our top 10, only because as we look at growing a lot of these fruits and vegetables in pots, this one brings up a good point. Anytime we're dealing with some kind of rooted crop, you want to make sure that the pot is deeper than it is broad. And so depth is more important on root crops versus a nice wide pot. Here's a variety that uh, has been hybridizes for container gardens. Um, here is a, uh, it's kind of a, uh, a cabbage mix. And what um, you can see there by the height and width, it really tends to stay kind of small. If you've ever grown a cabbage before, they can almost tend to be almost three feet wide. Now here we have one that's only 14 inches wide and it's somewhat ornamental in nature, but it's kind of more of a, a personalized cabbage. Now, Burpee came out with um, a corn variety that we can now grow in pots. I mean, what you know about corn is typically they had to be row planted for pollination. Now, here comes one that is a little bit shorter in stature, so it, it works better in a pot. I mean, don't get me wrong, it still needs a big container. You can see there 24 inches on the bottom or about three quarters of the way down there. But at least it, it's something that we can kind of put into a container that allows for some kind of fun. You know, as we look at the, the simple rules for growing a container garden, it was thriller, spiller, filler. Um, here's your, your thriller in the way of height. And you can kind of imagine growing some fruits and vegetables along the base there. But kind of a neat thing to have in a pot. Not many people can say they've grown corn in a pot. Cucumbers again here, no big deal to this. Um, but I would, if you're gonna do something like cucumbers, just know that they are a vining crop. And I would probably stick with varieties that tend to be more on the uh, the bush type variety, Space Master, the pick a bush, the patio snacker. Um, being this is a vine, make sure that you feed this guy pretty thoroughly. I mean, monthly through the season. Um, here's a new variety last year. This one, Patio Baby. You can see the fruits are only two to three inches. Um, in size, so they're more personalized. But you can see the height and width is starting to come down on, on something like this. So a lot of this stuff is starting, starting to come to market um, for small spaces. They understand that our, our yards just aren't as big as they used to be. And so they're bringing them down in size. <clears throat> Here's that zone five grape I was referring to. Um, this is Vitus Pixie, and you can see, and I thought this one was more kind of a conversation piece than anything else. Um, growing them in containers would be a struggle only because they are hardy to zone five. Here in Minnesota, we are four and three, if you're further north. And the struggle is trying to get it to survive in a pot. Now, there are ways to do it, but as I said, it's struggle. But it was kind of fun because, you know, wine tends to be kind of very trendy, and this would be a conversation piece that you can kind of put on your deck. And you can see by the height, it's only about one to two feet high and wide, so it's a nice small grape that will grow pretty quick in a in a pot. Kale, the new well, not new superfood, I guess superfood that that's been around for a while. Um, I don't know about you folks, but I am not a kale fan. I've tried to like it, I just can't do it. I understand that it's got all these nutrients in it. I maybe just I haven't found a way to to, to cook it and do it right. But anyway, there's um. 
there's a lot going on with kale. Um, they they understand that not everybody likes it, such as myself. So there's a lot of work going into producing varieties that are higher in sugar content, um, not bad sugars. These are natural sugar contents to make them more palatable. <clears throat> But one of the other struggles was the size of these things. Now you can see I have a little notation there, a five gallon pot works great. I would say that would be minimum five gallon pot. Uh, they prefer to be probably a little bigger. I mean, if you've ever grown kale before, this thing will get four or five feet tall and about three feet wide. So it's just a monster. But you can see there, my last comment down on the bottom is they came out with Prism last year, which is a new variety that's almost stemless. It grows much like a, a cabbage, just from a basil rosette there. And the picture in the upper left there is Prism. And I may have one later that shows the, the full plant. But basically, it only gets about 12 to 13 inches tall and about 14, 16 inches wide or so. So it's uh, kind of stemless. And so it's really nice for harvesting and, and growing in small spaces. Now here's a, I've got a couple of slides in here that kind of show some fun that you can have with a lot of this stuff. Uh, Pinterest is full of ideas with this. Uh, Instagram, I think, is as well. But, you know, lettuce is something that you can commonly grow year round. Usually when we've done lettuce, it's always been outside and we've planted it and we've basically planted a whole row of it or planted our whole little seed packet of it. All of a sudden we get into third week in June, let's say, and boom, we get bolting on it as we hit the heat of summer. And then it just does terribly. But that's where you can start to grow lettuce indoors, you know, in a in a window, east window, west window, possibly, depending upon if you got a little bit of shade here. But I think you can have fun with this. You can see in that bottom photo to the left there, if you've got kids that uh, you want to teach about gardening, here's a fun way to do it with a romaine lettuce. Typically, we don't use the bottom anyway. Here's a way to cut off the foliage, throw it in a little dish of water. You can even pot these things up. They'll develop a root system and continue to grow for you. So you can almost get kind of a, a second crop out of it just by, by cutting off foliage, eating what you need, and utilizing the base. But lettuce have been kind of hot only because they're they're starting to come out with a lot more colors um, as we realize, you know, eating things organically and, and trying to not cook so many of our foods. Of course, lettuce is kind of the main component in that. Lettuce wraps are, are real common out there and kind of trendy. You know, this is lettuce ruby glow. Um, it's kind of got some really neat color to it, kind of a mix of things. And, you know, going back to one of my slides before, when we talk about utilizing color in our food and the network uh, food network uh, really kind of pushing that there's a lot of color being produced by our hybridizers right now here's not necessarily a new one it's a fairly old actually it developed in the 1940s but as you can see there it's a uh, a melon that uh, is kind of personalized only grows to about three feet tall so this is one that you can kind of grow in pots um, in small spaces. Um, more personally, like I said, I've never had one of these personally. I understand they're good. I wouldn't say great, but I think we've been spoiled by some of our homegrown varieties that have been hybridized. But it, you know, it's, it's something that you can grow in a small space and still have it. Here is the next superfood out there. Uh, you'll see a lot of work being done on the mustard family coming up here. It tends to be higher in vitamin A and K than our kale friend was. Um, and it has a lot more benefits to it than I think um, our kale saw when I was looking at the information. But uh, you can see the, the bottom line there. It says if you're harvesting for the greens, there's a certain variety, the junctia that, that you have to kind of harvest. So you can't use all mustards if you're trying to do greens. Otherwise, uh, and I can't remember what the, um, the other species is, but it tends to be kind of bitter and more along of the fibrous. So it's really kind of, uh, what do you call it, uh, mealy kind of tasting. But this will be the, the next big thing that comes up. So you'll see a lot more mustards coming out on the market in the next few years. Not a big fan of okra, being a Minnesotan. I don't even know what to do with okra. But I like this one only because it adds an ornamental value to it. Um, it's still kind of a bigger plant, but as we look towards, you know, trying to introduce a lot of these things into our garden and create more, let's say, plant material that we can utilize, um, you know, growing okra with this one having color can kind of do that for us and it'll give us kind of a backdrop. So this would be something I plant in the back, maybe plant one and just to, to provide some color. Here's another one like our lettuce that you can kind of have some fun with. You can see from the photos there, 
easy to plant, easy to keep going. You know, I just, um, I do a lot of fried rice where I use uh, onion greens and I'll just kind of chop off the green parts on the top and use the other, the sprouts for something else. But um, here's an opportunity to kind of take these things and you can basically just kind of keep them going out in your garden. Now you can do, you know, on, uh, onion seedlings. Uh, you can plant your own seeds, do onion sets. Um, here's another way that you can kind of cut, uh, cut to the chase and, and kind of do a, a crop of onions pretty quickly. Um, I threw this slide in here because you can still, I mean, you can grow anything into a pot, but, you know, here's a variety when you're, you're growing peas. Peas don't like the, the heat of summer. So this would be something I would highly recommend doing in a pot, but just know that its time is going to come to an end and you're going to have to probably plant something else into it. And so as we look at doing, you know, crops out in the garden, it used to be where we went out and kind of planted the whole thing and then came back and we harvested, you know, throughout the summer. I think as we kind of move on here, that that view is going to change and we're going to be planting things basically throughout the summer years and utilizing every aspect and every inch of our garden. <clears throat> so definitely do uh, peas, but know that you're going to uh, have to replace them kind of midsummer. Um, and then I do like um, I do a lot of oriental foods. And so I love cooking uh, the pea shoots. I mean, they're just fabulous. Peppers can be both uh, utilized and as used as an ornamental. Um, you can see here, there's, I mean, there's the sky's limit when it comes to peppers. Uh, they're developing a lot of varieties that are conducive for pots. The variety on the left there is a, a newer variety last year called Mad Hatter. I thought it had kind of an ornamental deal with it, but um, it's got, it's sweet and it's kind of citrusy at the same time. So you can do peppers in pots. Radishes, I just kind of threw in there only because here's something that, I mean, you know that whenever you're doing planting in the garden or planting in a pot, there's always a hole somewhere. And so here's an opportunity. You can uh, plant either the seeds, um, do them as sprouts, or in the bottom right there, you can see that's basically the bottom part of the root from a radish. Uh, so basically, you're, you've taken the roots, you've cut off the greens, you cut off the roots. Well, you can plant that little root and you're going to get another radish to form. Uh, leaves are going to come off the side here and kind of grow and boom, ended up with a with another radish. And you can see it's it's a fast crop. So you have a few short weeks and you've got it. You could do a whole segment on strawberries. And I just kind of threw uh, three slides in here just to kind of give you some examples. Here is what we commonly know of strawberries, the old strawberry pot in the bottom left there. Um, Strawberries and hay baskets are absolutely marvelous if you've never done that. Vertically, you know, you can do the, the towers there. You can do the pots like we saw uh, done vertically in the slide before. But this is where I was talking about that PVC pipe. You know, if you're going to do something vertical like this, make sure you get a PVC pipe, you know, drill holes in it, and then stick it down through the center so you can water top to bottom more efficiently. And that works pretty good with both the strawberry pot and our, our tall vertical one here. Um, here's an example of somebody that did some strawberries on the patio and basically took just removed a few blocks and planted strawberry plants and they can harvest strawberries all summer long with an um, everlasting variety. But here's is what I was referring to about doing a whole segment on it. There's I, I never realized strawberries were such a big business. I guess it's multi-billion dollar or some crazy number. And so they They've really gone a lot into hybridizing strawberry species. I don't know if anybody's ever tried the, the one on the bottom right there is a pine berry. And um, you see it's more commonly in, in Europe, uh, in this case, England than anywhere else, but it has finally come to the United States. Um, be careful if you see this in the garden center, make sure that it's tissue cultured versus starting from seed. I have heard that um, starting these string from seed oftentimes does not come out to be a true, but it's kind of a fun variety. It's um, it's called pineberry for a reason. It's a cross. The flavor is a cross between a pineapple and a strawberry. So, it, and it really does. I had them in the garden center last year, and it was kind of fun to watch them. Not a heavy producer, but definitely kind of fun. The photo on the left here is is where you're seeing things going. So, if we go back a couple of slides and look at our initial one, typically what we know of strawberries is you basically plant them on a mound. The the stolons kind of cascade over the side, and that's where your strawberries are produced. But you can see in this case, the breeding has gone towards bringing those, the flowers and the fruit above the foliage. And so their contention for use in pots is much greater than it used to be. 
<clears throat> so expect a lot to be happening in strawberries. I heard there's a variety coming out, I think it's next year, that has the, the flavor of double bubble, bubble gum. And the cotton candy is another one they're th talking about. Uh, they're also breeding for size. So um, I understand there's a strawberry now on the market. It's not currently commercial, but that's the first place you'll see it. But the strawberry is as big as your fist. So some fascinating things happening there. Tomatoes can be fun in pots. I had mentioned my uh, my friend that grows one in a hanging basket, but uh, they're doing a lot of hybridizing here. As you can see, Micro Tom has been out on the, the market for a long time, but there's Tumbling Tom. Um, I saw one at the uh, Missouri, oh, what was it? Oh. Well, one of the colleges at one of the trade shows, and they have a test gardens there. And this variety of tomato, it... <laughs> Talk about determinant. It, you know how you have your apex, your growing tip of your plant material that tends to kind of grow into a vine. This one terminated the apex and everything ran out the sides. So instead of covering um, up, it, it went laterally along the ground. And so I, I realize that may take up some space, but I see that more utilized in the case of our hanging basket here where it kind of cascades down the side and it's not gonna be so unwieldy tall. Uh, the one in the photo on the right here, the upper right, that was my smart pot photo. And I, I grew a variety called Champion in there. Of course, you know, by this time I had stripped away a bunch of leaves so I could take a photo. But it was just a, an amazing plant and talk about producing. And by all means, companion plant. Uh, I know marigolds have been kind of uh, disavowed by gardeners over the years because that was always grandma's plant. But grandma planted it for a reason. And you can see here, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful insect repellent. I think I saw that it repels over 300 different types of insects. So I see this being used really commonly in and around your pots. If you're, you're planning to do vegetables in pots, plant one with a marigold in it, uh, put marigold pots up near your doors, surround your, your vegetable garden with them just to kind of help you with any bug problems that may be potentially harmful. And so with that, I appreciate it. Wow, right on time. I uh, appreciate you spending time with us. Um, I don't know if you have any questions at all. Here comes Laura. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, we are a little bit over time, so I think we can answer a few questions. But if you have more, I can connect them with you via Absolutely. email. OK, Absolutely. terrific. That was a big topic. Oh, yes, it was wonderful. I loved that strawberry pathway. <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So Tim's question is, when discussing watering, are polymers like soil moist considered organic? So are polymers like the product soil moist? Are those considered organic? Are they okay to use? Yeah, there was, there was a reason why I didn't kind of throw that into the presentation. Um, soil moist, it, like he says, is a polymer, and it's a conglomerate of things. It's commonly seen in baby diapers. It's what makes them effectively absorb the moisture there. The drawback to soil moist is no, they are not organic. And the worst part is they tend to kind of take forever to break down. So they, they kind of hang around for a long time. Well, thank you very much, Mark. And again, if you have any questions, um, we can connect you with him via email. Um, so thank you, and thank you, everyone, for attending tonight's webinar. If you have any other questions, again, contact us. Um, and once you leave tonight's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of tonight's webinar. Oh. If that's okay with you. Yeah, yep, absolutely. okay. Um, so on behalf of MSHS and our presenter, Mark, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your evening.